Welcome to Politics Done Right. I am your host, Egberto Willis. This is a progressive program that will take the mystery out of politics. This is the program that will encourage you to make sure government becomes we the people. Whether you are liberal, progressive, conservative, or otherwise, you get to hear your point of view. We are an independent media outlet that, unlike mainstream media beholden to corporations, we only owe allegiance to you. Remember, you can also send me a tweet at E-G-B-E-R-T-O-W-I-L-L-I-E-S. That is at Egberto Willis. Let us engage. It is politics done right. Welcome to another edition of Politics Done Right. Today, we have a very, very special guest. Born and educated in Los Angeles, California, Dr. William Branston received his MD at the University of Southern California School of Medicine, completed his internship in pediatrics at Children's Hospital of Los Angeles, and was a resident in psychiatry at Menninger School of Psychiatry in Topeka, Kansas, while a senior in medical school, Bronston founded the Student Health Organization in 1964, a nationwide graduate health science student movement dedicated to promoting universal health care all the way back in 64, folks, as a human rights overcoming racism, sexism, war, poverty, and physician elitism, which many of us know about in the health system as the greatest challenges face in society. He is the author of the book, Public Hostage, Public Ransom, Ending Institutional America. And it's now in paperback. Welcome to Politics Done Right, Dr. Bronson. How are you doing today? Thank you, sir. It's a really honor to be with you. Man, it's an honor to be with you, man. And look, let me tell you, first of all, especially in these times, you know, I have a wife with lupus. I have a... 32-year-old daughter who's had two strokes. The healthcare system is a is a crapshoot at best, but it's capitalism gone amok. And I'm going to want to discuss some of that as we get into our discussion here. But anyway, why don't you tell me a little bit about yourself before we get started? Well, I'm an organizer. I'm a physician, but I'm 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 absolutely wedded to social justice. And uh, I, I became a doctor because I just wanted to care. I, I, I think that caring for people is one of the most profound and fulfilling experiences imaginable. And uh, uh, the problem is that the, the contradiction between trying to care for people in our delivery system and dealing with the entrenched bureaucratic interests and the profit-driven uh, wealth transfer agenda that essentially intoxicates, pollutes our delivery system is absolutely uh, inexcusable, intolerable. We, we live in a barbarous situation that divides us and isolates us. And so my whole agenda has been to organize unions, to organize student communities, uh, to speak out against and act out against the wars, against racism, and against the uh, the inhumanity and the, and the alienation of our medical education system, in order to challenge and change the curriculum, which I've been doing all my life. I'm 84 now, yeah. so you know, Doctor Bronson, a long time. I mean, and you look great. That's all I can tell you. You look great. <laughs> but that that said, let me just say this: you've been doing it a long time. Long time. Uh, that is worrisome uh, to to many of us that you have had to be doing it for such a long time with such little change within our healthcare system. But I think we may be, we have the choice to make now a flex point. Um, I don't know your thoughts on that. I, I think we are at a point where we can change the trajectory because enough people are becoming aware now, much so, much more so than when people had the semblance of prosperity as Dr. Richard Wolf would say. The problem is that people are afraid of losing something and they're afraid of what they don't know. And the uh, cartels, the pharmaceutical hospital insurance industries have such limitless money in order to control the media and to control the message 
of disinformation and terrifying people. So I believe you're right. I believe that we are at an inflection point. I believe that what's happening in terms of organized labor beginning to rise up, the fact that we have been coming at this issue to establish universal single-payer health care for now 40 or 50 years is beginning to have an impact. But we have a gigantic, gigantic challenge against all the money in the world, which means that the only way we're going to turn this thing around is if the people in the society embrace and understand and are able to deflect the propaganda that will scare them to make this transformation. It's got to happen in law. But the legislatures are bought off to a large extent, which means we're going to have in California and have to go to a proposition. And that proposition is, is going to require hundreds of thousands of people signing and then voting and organizing and volunteering. When we did this in 1995, Prop, uh, uh, Prop 186, right. we had the largest number of volunteers ever in a proposition campaign. And so the question is, why aren't the people now moving in their self-interest in order to address this question? And the book essentially is a piece of an expose to look at the utter evil of Medicare, Medi-Cal, Medicaid, before before we get into that part with book because that is actually quite important i mean california actually passed uh i mean you you had a majority a super majority in your house uh both the uh, i think you call i don't remember if you called it uh, the assembly and the senate in both. the assembly a, a, the other place is delegate governor and a democratic governor and and you actually had a bill a single payer bill and even under universal almost universal democratic rule you couldn't get it passed you know that the bill passed in the legislature twice when they knew that our republican governor would veto the bill and when the bill then came up again after we had a democratic governor the legislature fractured because there's too much money in the legislature and you can go on google and you can look up the kind of money that our legislators are receiving from lobbyists, from the industry, from the cartels, from pharmaceutical, from hospitals, from insurance, it's in the millions. And so we have very few honest legislators that are willing to go against the money that they're receiving to stay in power. So this Democratic majority isn't necessarily a Democratic little d majority. It's a big D Democratic majority. And we have to go to the people for a direct vote. We have to go to the people. And that is a daunting, challenging agenda for almost all organizers. It's scary. It's scary. But the, the stakes are phenomenal. Phenomenal. Now, I, I want to get into your book. But again, one, one last question. Please. You talk about going to the people, and which yeah. I'm 100%. There are a lot of states that do, in effect, allow referendums. We look at what occurred in Ohio, where the, the you know, or we look at what are, occurred in Kansas. All of these are red states where uh, things actually got done by the people uh, instead of by a gerrymandered uh, uh, legislature, et cetera. But, you know, um, I don't know um, if, if you've noticed. Well, of course, you've noticed that in the country, what the right wing and our neoliberalism, neoliberalists has been doing is stacking the court with people with a certain way of thinking. And my concern is always that that has always been to stifle democracy. The people say they want this. And all the, these gods in the court need to do is say, well, that is unconstitutional. Before we get into your book, have you had any thoughts about when, because I am, like you said, and I agreed with earlier, I think we are at a flex point, an inflection point. And that is that people are starting to see it. Now, when people see it and get the right people elected, are they going to be overturned by the minority in the judiciary? I don't think so. I mean, again, you know, we're talking about whether or not we have a totalitarian state right. or whether we have a democratic society. And what you're seeing now is a very interesting situation where the, the 
the UPS workers and the uh, the UAW workers and the Screen Actors Guild and the Writers Guild and and uh, and and the and the coffee you know, organizers. There's a, a rising up from the rank and file and a support for trade union leadership. Up to now, the organized union movement has tended to block single payer because they need yes. the trust funds that they hold in order to recruit membership. It's very complicated, Egberto. Right. But I believe that we have the ability to mobilize. We're, we're planning to call a meeting in April uh, that's going to be done by a colleague of mine in order to bring key speakers and to bring rank and file leaders from across the trade union movement, the nurses organization are the warrior queens that are driving the yes, single payer agenda. Are. The California yes, Nurses are. and the National Nurses Union. But there are there are elements that essentially seep into those relationships that are paid for by Kaiser Insurance and similar kinds of, of interest groups that are trying to, to complicate and, and defuse that effort for single payer. It's, it's more, than, more than we can really talk about here in the show at this particular time, but we are moving to pull together labor because without organized labor, we can't take that next step. Whether we can solve the problem at a right-wing court situation, that's way down the line. The first thing is we have to get the people to act in their own interest and to understand that the suffering that they all experience and the fear and insecurity that they all hold in their heart because they're never sure whether something's going to happen that they can't cope with, they can't pay for, has got to somehow be assuaged. It's got to be comforted. Absolutely so, my friend. Absolutely so. Tell me something about public hostage, public ransom, ending institutional America. What does that really mean? This is a piece of the puzzle. What's happened is that in 1965. Uh, you're, you're, you're muted. Oh, sorry. I accidentally hit the button. Yeah. In 1965, the Social Security Act was passed that established Medicare and Medicaid in the United States. Medicaid is a third rate, low reimbursement system with very, very punishing eligibility requirements. You have to have no money and you have to have certain problems uh, as in terms of being elderly or disabled and so forth. And most health workers won't pay, won't, 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 won't serve Medicaid clientele because of the low rates. The Medicaid system has plowed $6 trillion into our economy to establish a vast institutional culture, nursing homes, a supported living, hospice services, and it's all being privatized now. The private big corporations are buying out all of these facilities in order to own them privately rather than have them publicly funded. Willowbrook was the ultimate cancer, the largest cancer of this institutional system. And the state of New York milked the Medicaid system in order to essentially fund itself and to maintain this, this gigantic uh, network of large institutions in the state of New York with no community services of any kind to provide individual care for people with special needs, with mental retardation, cerebral palsy, autism, and so on and so forth. So the, the institution became a closed secret system in a very a uh, rural part of New York City. And I went there to work because my training was in child development at Children's Hospital. I was trained by one of the top people in the country, in the world, in terms of child development. And I needed a job when I was in New York City uh, because of some other issues that came up prior to that. I, I had organized a, a Council 50 AFSCME Union in Kansas, which seized all the hospitals in Eastern Kansas instead of striking the hospitals. So I couldn't really go to a place where they would check my background. Mm -hmm. Anyway, when I went to New York, I, I applied at Willowbrook because I figured they would they would hire me. And I'm, I'm a good doctor and I, I'm, I'm very skilled in child development. And the when I walked into that place, I was I was thunderstruck. I knew ahead of time that state hospitals were evil, but I had no idea how evil. And it took me a year or more to really understand and see and, 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 and get a sense of the gravity of brutality 
and inhumanity and deprivation and violence that the facility imposed on the people. There was inadequate staff, inadequate food, inadequate clothing, inadequate medication, inadequate medical coverage, and gigantic crowding. When I started there, there were close to 6,000 broken people, which I call public hostages, because they were there in order to draw Medicaid money to the state of New York at the level of about two to $300 a day. But what wow. people actually uh, funded for in the institution probably was, was less than $20 a day. I mean, you can't imagine the squalor, the crowding, the, the filth, the disease that existed there and the violence that existed there. And it was a closed system. Families would be forced to put their kids in there and then they were told not to come back for six months to let the kid accommodate to that deprivation. And the families watched as they came to visit their, their child being destroyed, broken noses, gashes, uh, cuts, an incredible, incredible squalor. And the workers would not let the families inside the buildings. They would deliver the kid to the front door. And so when I began working there, the first thing I began to do was to invite the families inside to show them why their kids were being so physically mutilated. When I worked there for a period of time, I, I, I began to, to try and practice the best medicine I could, but it was very threatening to the administration. And so they sanctioned me over and over again and transferred me to bigger and bigger buildings, deeper and deeper in the bowels of the institution. And when it was all over, when it was all over, I knew that I had to tell this story for a number of reasons. Number one, I wanted to tell the story because I wanted people who were progressive organizers to understand how to deal with public services as an organizer in large bureaucracies, even though you may be alone. There's a way to beat these giants. Secondly, I needed to figure out a way to strengthen the parent organizations to understand that they have to be better organized in order to advocate for ending this horrible institutional system. And, and I, I, very much, I very much wanted to somehow understand how looking behind the scenes at where the money was coming from as a way of understanding why things never changed in these institutions, why they were so embedded, why they were so intractable in terms of shutting them down. Bottom line is, we filed a federal class action lawsuit for crimes against humanity against the governor and the state. And we won the suit. It took it took years for that suit to happen because the you know the wheels of justice turned oh, yeah. very slowly. But the place has now been turned into a college, a, a, a state college of New York called um, uh, Staten Island College. And and the struggle was enormous. Uh, Geraldo Rivera did an expose at one point when I had a colleague of mine that was working there that was fired for having parents meetings there. Um, uh, he called Geraldo, who was a beloved friend of ours, that was a lawyer that we were working with prior before he became an ABC correspondent. Geraldo did this incredible show. And then we did a major show with Dick Cavett, you know, that that mm -hmm. brought two of the undertakers from the bureaucracy down, you know, the, the chief of mental retardation for the state and their public relations guy. And we had parents there. Geraldo was on stage, my comrade, myself. And, and so we began to mobilize a very large public campaign for the general public to understand something that was invisible to them and that they couldn't even imagine was existing based on their tax dollars. So the book is that story, an illustrated story. And there's photographs in the book to show the impact of the violence of the institution, not the grotesquerie or the, or the spectacle. And, and it, it, it's an effort to, to put everything I understand as a lifetime organizer in terms of how I understand the political map of the bureaucracy, of the public bureaucracy in New York, and it's evil, it's, it's corruption, it's, it's arrogance. Now, what you just showed was uh, the actual public sector misbehaving in the way it used federal dollars. And I think you, you say in, a, in one of our, uh, our points here, uh, follow the money. In other words, you said they, they were getting on the order of $300 per patient 
at the, for these locations. And if they were spending $20, you know, that would be a lot. So the question is, they were diverting all that money elsewhere. Now, it's interesting because that, believe it or, you know, a lot of folks would say, you see, there it is. Government don't work again. And I would say I, I can, I bet I could hypothesize, hypothesize and say that, well, because they didn't want to tax effectively their rich benefactors, they found a way to cheat to get money from elsewhere. I'm just hypothesizing right there. Now, that said, additionally, what's interesting is government has gone from that type of corruption, right? to where the private sector type corruption corruption you spoke about before. Because if we take a look at how the private, uh, the private nursing home systems and the private care systems work right now, it's the same method that they use. Minimize the amount of money for the patient care, maximize the amount of money for the corporations who are running and taking over home after home after home, meaning care center after care center after care center. And likewise, hospitals that most of the money no longer goes into care, but it goes into profit and otherwise, which tells me we do need that bill of health care rights that the law has to guarantee. I think you mentioned that up front. People can't imagine getting care in our system without paying for it. Right. They can't imagine that. They can't imagine not having nursing homes to handle their elder and dependent relatives because they have to be able to go to work and they can't take care of somebody who needs around the clock right. services. And they can't imagine a transformation of the workforce that really is a socialized workforce that is diverse, that is culturally competent that is multilingual, that is around the clock, and that is individualized in order to transform the society into a different kind of an entity than what we have now. What we have now is so barbarous and so embedded in people's expectation and familiarity that the idea of transforming society seems unreachable. It, it, it's intimidating. It, it, it absolutely paralyzes people. And the misinformation out there and the authoritarian power of the delivery system is terribly, terribly intimidating for, for ordinary people. They just don't have a sense of being able to beat that, that situation. It's not that the government is bad. It's that bad government is bad. It's not, it's not, it's not that that the private sector is is, I mean, what's happened is that from the state forcing us to defraud the federal government by misrepresenting and upcoding what we were dealing with in the institution. But what's happening now, which is now 50 years later from when my battle was uh, existed in Willowbrook, the whole situation now exists for the entire population because as we age, Egberto, we become essentially dependent. And like people that were labeled then with mental retardation or cerebral palsy or autism or, or muscular dystrophy or whatever, now by just being old, the parents who fought to deinstitutionalize their kids are, are into institutions themselves. And the kids who are now 50 years older are headed back into congregate segregated facilities because they're old, not because they have some special need other than the fact that they need assistance in terms of some operational you know, need that they have in their lives. So the whole society now is faced with the most severe, challenging, universal issue of democratizing our society and humanizing our culture and looking out for each other through a universal system that's paid by progressive taxation with no cost at the point of service that covers everything. And that's the magic. And, you know, people don't understand it. Now, earlier you had mentioned uh, people don't can't imagine going to some uh, being in a nursing home or going to a hospital or getting medical care and not paying yeah. for it. And my, my thing is, I, 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 I kind of refrain from saying not paying for it as opposed to saying we are all paying for it just by our existence of Americans being Americans within a society that's uh, that's an active part of the economy. We're actually all 
paying for it. There's nothing anybody is getting for free. Even the welfare recipient is a functional part of the economic system because they are a conduit of the circulation of money. However, it's gotten and and it, it you know I wrote a book a, 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 a last a couple of years ago called uh, How to Make America Utopia Take Our System from Being Rigged. And the reason I did that was to say, imagine, just imagine what right. things could be. And right. I love the way you brought that up earlier. Um, you said in in our conversation just now, you said Americans just can't believe that they can get the things that they deserve. They are so indoctrinated that they believe it is far fetched. I mean, I, Stephanie Kelton, uh, one of the one of my favorite myth, MMP, I, yeah. myth of, of monetary right, absolutely brilliant, uh, modern brilliant monetary woman. theory. And you know, I sit down and I listen, and it's like. You know, it's amazing that we've always implemented MMT for corporations, right? When yeah. we have a war, we use MMT. Yeah. When we had the pandemic, we used MMT. Auto when we had the collapse. crisis in, right. in, in 2008, we That's used right. MMT. But right. Right somehow we can't use it for humanity, for our American brothers and sisters in need. Your thoughts? It is a class issue, Egberto. It's a class issue. The, the the ruling class essentially dominates our legislature and they essentially service the rich at the expense of the 99%. So we're in a situation now where uh, I, I, I really believe this flex point is happening because the suffering is just incredible. First of all, the existing system will bankrupt America. There is no, there is no uh, limit to what the cartels can charge for services. Exactly. Number two, we have twice as much money in the system right now than any other country in the world, and yet 30%, one out of every three people in America, cannot afford to use the care that they essentially are being paid, are pay, that, we, that we're paying for, which is an extraordinary phenomenon. And then the care that's provided is dehumanizing and violent and oppressive and extractive care. It's not health care, it's medical market services. And we have to come up with a public health system. We have to buy out upfront all medical debt. We have to fund all the people that are now forced to take care of somebody in their family for nothing and not go to work. We have to end job lock in terms of making sure that people don't have to work at mindless numbing jobs for a fragment of some kind of service rather than having comprehensive services provided. We don't think of us paying for the fire department. We don't think of us paying for the military. We don't think of us paying for the police department, for the road system, for the public school system. Why is it that we think we have to pay for medical services that are so fundamental to our ability to save, to invest, and for prosperity? The, 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 when people argue that whatever we're talking about will cost too much, that puts us in a defensive position. And we really should be putting our opposition in a defensive position to talk about the prosperity that would come from liberating people from the oppression and the fear of not being taken care of, of the investment that we would do in terms of expanding the public health system, of expanding the workforce. I mean, the, the, there, are, there are transformational issues that are just profoundly exciting. I spent a year with 40 of the smartest people in the country that I could pull together. Every Saturday, we met for two hours on Zoom in order to imagine the very best health healthcare delivery system we could. And it's on a website called ourhealth.pub.public. The whole model is there. And now... The job that I'm struggling with is to get mass organizations to think about the best possible healthcare system that we can imagine and put it into place. Because unless we deal with those issues that will inspire the general public, rightful care, comprehensive benefits, ending medical debt, essentially providing specialized teams for mental health services, for rural and agrarian health, for uh, educational system, the, the, the people that need to go into the school system, K-24, 
are different than the people that have to go into the farms and into the rural areas to deal with farm worker health and, and with the agricultural world. The people that have to deal with the, the, the catastrophic, uh, 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 outrageous situation with the houseless community is a different, different crowd. You know, we're pouring millions of dollars to deal with homelessness with, with absolutely no success whatsoever because we're not dealing with it from a social standpoint. There's a, a, an incredible, incredible book uh, that was written by this marvelous young woman who lives in, in Philadelphia called Health Communism. Mm -hmm. and it's, a, it's a powerhouse, like your book. It's a powerhouse. It changes the whole way people look at and identify with and understand what they're due. We're already paying for a system that we're not getting. Exactly. And it's an outrage, an exactly. outrage. Exactly. Exactly. Now, uh, let me let me just before we close, I want to first say how impressed I am to hear. I can't call it your point of view. I have to call it the point of view, because um, because until we get there. Until we are able to find a way to to have people get that courage and belief that they can that not only that they can achieve, but that they've deserve that they've earned that right for that kind of life. After all, we built the most powerful country bar none. That wasn't done by Bezos. That wasn't done by Gates. That wasn't done by Elon Musk. That was done by us. The problem is we have a we have a media, a propaganda engine that would have you believe that some industrialists who doesn't have your mindset, who doesn't have the mindset to create that somehow they are the ones because they are the guardians of capital that somehow we depend on them. So, Dr. Uh, Dr. Bronson, let me ask you to uh, close out this way. Please tell me how best do we get this communicated, not just to the union worker, but to Americans in general, because that's the only solution, a vote in America that feels itself worthy of all that we preach. Let me just say at the lowest level, people should read my book. Uh, I'm not looking for money, but people have to understand the evil of Medicaid and the evil of institutionalization and be alarmed and alerted to the danger of their own future and the future of their family. We must change the system. Otherwise, we're all going to wind up in institutions. Then in terms of dealing with the change, we have to have a written model, a written model that people can essentially look at and make minor changes in the language or in the model. I have produced that model because without that model, we're talking generalities. You were blowing smoke and people have to have a document that they can look at that describes in detail all aspects of a true public health driven healthcare delivery system. Then we have to figure out how to put together the public base of the cutting edge, the vanguard group of organizers that have internalized the moral imperative of this agenda. People like Bill Barber, people like Ralph Nader, pe people like the head of Black Lives Matter, of Me Too, of, of, the, of the youth that are working on gun violence. We have to build some kind of a coalition across vertical interests in our society, whether it's gun violence or misogyny or whatever. And we must, we must somehow sit down with labor and be able to recruit labor, organize labor, because they may not be anywhere near a majority, but they have the organized power and they have the fundamental basic dollars that we're gonna have to have in order to reach the people. And we need programs of people like yourself in order to essentially trumpet the truth, trumpet the discussion, build in a sense of confidence and comfort and conviction an outrage in the general public that this must be done, it will be done, and we will do it. We will do it. 
Dr. Brunson, what would you have liked me to ask you that I didn't? <laughs> can we do another two hours? We can do 20 hours. We actually, you'll be, let me tell you better. You'll be on again, but I still want an answer to that question. You'll be definitely on again because I mean, I, 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 I want to tell you something offline, but go ahead and uh, tell me what would you have loved for me to ask you? I, I stump everybody with that one, but I love to do it. Uh, you know, there's a romance to caring. Mm -hmm. And it's not easy to talk about, you know, the question of why, who I am and why I am who I am. Uh, I don't know if I could answer the question. The problem is not that the questions are hard, but the answer is hard. Mm -hmm. You know, we live in a world that is so challenged with cruelty and dehumanization. And we need we need to move the general public into a new place and I believe the question is, what role does universal health care play in the panorama of issues of dealing with poverty, climate issues, uh, you know, and, and the other major pillars of challenge that we're faced with? We're faced with the most frightening time ever, 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 politically and, and, and ecologically. And, and, and I think, I think that, that the, the, the question of how we're going to go about convincing each other to have the courage and the love and the community to be together, to, to listen to each other, to have some sense of inspiration and conviction and discipline to move through the opposition. The, the, I mean, the opposition is all around us. They control the public mass media. Your kind of programming and the programming that's come from... So, how, so I guess the big question is, how can we mobilize the progressive forces in the social media system to deal with what's going on now with Elon Musk and with the other people that are essentially turning social media into a fascist propaganda machine? And my story is a story that I think will be inspiring, that the book has 80 photographs in it, and the photographs are grouped into chapters that essentially show the violence, not the spectacle of the institution. People need to, to, to internalize, they need to understand that it's appropriate to find out about things, to ask about things, to study, to read, to read, and, 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 and somehow just to have the courage every day to be committed to change with their communities, at their churches, at their synagogues, in their in their book clubs, in their in, in their their social gatherings, people have to start talking to each other about the transformation of power. The people have to own the healthcare system. We can't let the private sector own our lives and our well-being. Dr. William Bronston, author of Public Hostage, Public Ransom. Ending Institutional America. It's out in paperback. It will be in the blog and we'll have it flashed on the screen how to get that book. We cannot help but say thank you so kindly for having been on Politics Done Right. I'm greatly indebted, brother. Thank you so much. Amen. Mohayildin, he justifiably questions whether uh, uh, Israel has really found uh, that the hospital, the, the Al-Shifa hospital, is somehow a control center for Hamas. More than likely, in my personal opinion, just based on the evidence that they attempted to show, which was so minimal, it was so minimal, the evidence that they try to show, it could all it almost be a setup. But listen to what Eamon had to say, and I think it, it, it'll put it into better perspective. When you hear about the reporting from Al Shifa Hospital, what is your what's your sort of assessment about what's going on here? Well, the first thing I think of is back in 2008 when I was based in the Gaza Strip and I would go to the Shifa Hospital to report frequently on all kinds of stories. Um, these allegations that the Israelis have been making have been making literally for 15 years. You can go back to 2008 and see Israeli officials making the same statements that Al Shifa Hospital was being used by Hamas as a command and control center. Sometimes they would call it the headquarters. They would say that's where the prime minister at the time would be hiding. And all I could tell you is based on my reporting there for years, I've been there hundreds of times, walked around all of the complex of Al Shifa Hospital, never once 
uh, had anyone interfere with our reporting, telling us you can't go here, you can't access that. That's one. Two, I think it's important for viewers to understand that a lot of the doctors who work at Al Shifa Hospital um, are foreign doctors, meaning they're volunteer doctors. Yeah. They come from the UK, they come from Sweden, some have come from the United States. And many of those doctors as well, um, we hear the, the language sometimes that the doctors and the hospitals are run and controlled by Hamas. But the truth is these doctors are Americans, Europeans, um, certainly no allegiance to Hamas whatsoever. And they have spoken openly about what they have seen and how they were never denied any access to anywhere in the hospital grounds for them to be able to go and see for themselves. That's not to say it's not true. I'm just saying it's been 15 years of these allegations, hundreds of reporters who have passed through those hallways, hundreds of doctors, including local and foreign doctors who have come through there and never substantiated by anybody outside of uh, the Israelis and now the Americans. The, the president was asked point blank about the intelligence he had that 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 the Al Shifa Hospital was a Hamas headquarters. He he said clearly in a press conference yesterday, Hamas does have headquarters weapons material below this hospital, and I suspect others. The U.S. is very out front on this, yeah. and it feels like a lot hangs on the IDF's ability to show that this, in fact, was a Hamas headquarters. Right. This feels like an incredibly weighted moment for all of this. And I wonder what you make of Biden's strategy thus far. So again, I would say as a journalist, where is the evidence? Where is the intelligence? Um, I'm old enough to have remembered 2003 and the whole weapons of mass destruction uh, debacle in Iraq. So I, I err on the side of caution when it comes to governments and intelligence officials saying, here's the proof and we're going to war for this proof. Again, it's not to say that it's not true. It's just simply to say, we would need to see what that evidence is. And Israel would have to make a compelling case. And they have now been in control of Al Shifa Hospital for the better part of 48 hours going on to 72 hours tomorrow. And what we have seen so far raises a lot of questions as to how they have described it. So uh, again, they described it as a Hamas headquarters or command and control. The language has shifted a little bit from command and control to a, as Admiral Kerber said earlier, a nod or node, uh, a command and control node, which I'm not sure what that distinction is, yeah. but it just seems like it's a slightly downgraded description of what's inside. And what we're seeing also really raises questions. Genocide. You cannot, based on everything that uh, Israel has done in uh, Gaza, that's the only valid, only valid assertion one can make about what's occurring there today. For all of you who watch my program on a daily basis, you know that I interviewed Diane Archer of the organization called Just Care USA. She wrote an op-ed in Common Dreams that I want us to cover today because it's important. December 7th, December 7th is a deadline to enroll in Medicare Disadvantage, in many Medicare Disadvantages. They call it Medicare Advantage. Remember, it is really Medicare Disadvantage. Why? Because it is run by the private sector who is taking our tax dollars to, uh, for private, to, to, to transfer it directly to shareholders, executives, and whatever is left over, they go ahead and give you health care. Remember that. They like to say it the other way around. They like to say they efficiently provide health care, whatever is left, they then give it to the, you know, it, it, it's a profit for the, but that's not what it does. They ensure their profits first. And that's how they go about skimming, scamming you. I repeat, that's how they go about scamming you. That's how they go about scamming you. All right, let's get busy. And let me put that on the screen so you guys can kind of take it along with me. But I want you all to pass this article around. I have it inside of the blog, but I'm going to put it in a chat as well. Let people read this article. But we're for our podcast, we need to go through it right this minute. So here we go. Seven questions to ask to protect yourself from Medicare scams. So actually, let's reintroduce this. Uh, I, uh, Diane Archer, she is the... Uh, president of Just Care USA. It's a very important organization, an independent digital hub covering health and financial issues facing boomers and families. It's an important organization. We've interviewed her before here on 
politics done right. To ensure you have good coverage for both current and unforeseeable health needs, this open enrollment period, you should choose traditional Medicare. Seven questions to ask to protect yourself from Medicare Advantage. All right. During this Medicare uh, open enrollment period, ask yourself these seven questions. And please know that you can always call the Medicare Rights Center at 800-333-414. Or let me repeat, that is 800-333-4114. Or your SHIP State Health Insurance Assistance Program for free unbiased advice on any of your Medicare questions. Again, that is 800-333-4114. What are these seven questions? The first one is, what is the biggest difference between traditional Medicare and Medicare Advantage plan? Second question is, should I trust an insurance agent advice about my Medicare options? The, The simple answer is no. Why can't I rely on my friend's or the government to star uh, to star rating systems to pick a good Medicare Advantage plan. We're going to talk about that. I am enrolled in Medicare Advantage plan. Can I count on seeing the physicians listed in a network and lower costs? No. Uh, doesn't the government make sure that Medicare Advantage plan delivers the same benefits as traditional Medicare? No. If I join a Medicare Advantage plan, can I disenroll and switch? To a traditional Medicare, we got to talk about that one. We're going to talk about that one. If I have traditional Medicare and Medicaid, what should I do? We're going to talk about that. So let's go to the first question. What is the biggest difference between traditional Medicare and Medicare Advantage? According to uh, Diane Archer, and this is a fact, to ensure you have good coverage for both current and unforeseeable health needs, you should enroll in traditional Medicare. That's the only guarantee of good health care, not the private system called Medicare Advantage. If you have the ability not to do it, do not do it. In traditional Medicare, you and your doctor decide and the care you need with no prior approval. And you have the easy access to care from almost all doctors and hospitals in the United States with no incentive to stint on your care. In a Medicare Advantage plan, a corporate insurance company decides when you get care often requiring you to get its approval first. Medicare Advantage plans also restrict access to physicians and too often second-guess your treating physicians, denying you needed care inappropriately. The less care the Medicare Advantage plan provides, the more insurance company profits. You will pay more upfront in traditional Medicare if you don't have Medicaid and need to buy supplemental coverage, but you are likely to spend a lot less out of pocket when you need costly care. Regardless of whether you stay in traditional Medicare or enroll in Medicare Advantage, you still pay your Part B premium. See? Should I trust an insurance agent about Medicare Advantage? No. Unfortunately, Insurance agents are paid more to steer you away from Medicare and into a Medicare Advantage plan. And remember, Medicare Advantage is not Medicare. Medicare Advantage is not Medicare. Medicare Advantage is the same the same lousy private insurance that most Americans have. That's all it is. The only reason it's there is because old people, they never insured because it costs too much. So now they get the government to overpay them for insuring older people. Continuing. Uh, Unfortunately, insurance agents are paid more to steer them away from Medicare. While some insurance agents might be good, you can't know whom to trust. Keep in mind that while Medicare Advantage plans tell you that they offer you extra benefits, you still need to pay your Part B premium. And extra benefits are often very limited and come with high out-of-pocket costs. Be aware that many Medicare Advantage plans won't cover as much necessary medical and hospital care as traditional Medicare. It's important that you get that. Why can't I rely on my friends or government to steer me to the right Medicare Advantage plan? Unlike traditional Medicare, which gives you easy access to physicians and hospitals, you use 
for every everywhere in U.S. and allows for continuity of care. You can't count on Medicare Advantage to plan to cover your care from the health care providers listed in their network or to cover the medically ne- necessary care that traditional Medicare covers. Even if your friends say they are happy with their Medicare Advantage plan right now, they are gambling with their health care. The government's five-star rating system does not consider that some Medicare Advantage plans engage in widespread inappropriate de- delays and denial of care. And other Medicare Advantage plans engage in a different bad acts that can endanger your health. So while you should never sign up for Medicare Advantage plan with a one, two or three star rating, Medicare Advantage plans with four and five star ratings can have very high denial and delay rates. Okay. Number four, four. if I'm enrolled in a Medicare Advantage plan, can I count on seeing the physicians listed in the network? Hell no. Unfortunately, provider networks in Medicare Advantage plans can change at any time and your out-of-pocket costs can be as high as $8,300 this year for in-network care alone. You can study the uh, the Medicare Advantage plan literature and you can know your total out-of-pocket costs for in-network care, but you cannot know whether the uh, Medicare Advantage plan will refuse to cover the care you need or delay needed care for an extended period. This year alone, dozens of health systems have canceled their Medicare Advantage contracts, further restricting access to care for their their patients in Medicare Advantage because Medicare Advantage plans make it hard for them to give people needed care because they lowball them. They try to take, no, I'm not going to pay for that. Number five, doesn't the government make sure that Medicare Advantage plans deliver the same benefits as traditional Medicare? Hell no. The government cannot protect you from Medicare Advantage bad actors. The insurers offering Medicare Advantage plans can decide you don't need care when you clearly do. And there's no one stopping them. They are largely unaccountable for their bad acts. In the last few years, there have been multiple government and independent reports on insurance company bad acts in Medicare Advantage plans. Number six, if I... Join Medicare Advantage plan. Can I disenroll and switch to traditional Medicare? You can switch to traditional Medicare each annual open enrollment period. However, there is a caveat. Depending upon your situation, where you live, your income, your age, and more, you might not be able to get supplemental coverage to pick up your out-of-pocket costs and protect you from high costs. Why? What's worse you could incur thousands of dollars in out-of-pocket cost in Medicare Advantage. That is, you have to go back through the actuarial tables. You have to go and, and, and be, re, re, you know, re When you just, if you're 65, as soon as you enter, if you go for Medicare immediately, not Medicare Advantage, which isn't Medicare. So we, from now, we'll call it Medicare Disadvantage. If you just go for Medi- standard Medicare the supplemental have to take you at the current best cost that they have. If you go from Medicare, if you go at 65 right into Medicare, but if you go ahead and start it with Medicare Advantage and the next enrollment period you switch back, they can say, uh-uh, your rate's going to be higher. And uh-uh, you're kind of sick. And because you're kind of sick, what we're going to do is we're going to put you through the actuarial tables again, and we're going to charge you an arm and a leg for covering you. Folks, it's a ripoff. Medicare Advantage is a scam. Lastly, seven, I have traditional, if I have traditional Medicare and Medicaid, what should I do? If you have both Medicare and Medicaid, traditional Medicare covers virtually all your out-of-pocket costs. You will get much easier access to physicians and inpatient uh, services in traditional Medicare than in a Medicare Advantage plan if you need costly healthcare services or a complex condition. Again, call 800-833-4144 for your Medicare rights, folks, for your Medicare rights. Remember, This is very important. I cover this frequently. I cover this often. I cover this vociferously because the the 
private insurance company are scums that and I I I, I try not to use these bad these offensive words, but anybody who causes the death of people, every anybody who causes harm to our brothers and sisters, knowingly so, with false representations of what they do. I have no mercy in how I address them. Medicare Advantage is a scam. I repeat, Medicare, even if you enjoy Medicare Advantage now, at some point when your particular pool stops making the kind of money that they want to make for their shareholders and executives, as was pointed out in this article, they cancel plans on the fly. They say, okay, next year, this plan no longer exists and you have to re-up with some other plan. There is no, it's never about the patient. It is always about the Medicare Advantage private insurance companies making money for their shareholders and the execs. So please, folks, if you are in the house, if you are in the process of getting Medicare by December 7th every year or in December every year, please, 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 even if it costs you more, your life is worth more than saving a few dollars, than saving a few dollars. Please refrain from using Medicare Advantage. And if you have the wherewithal, find out what it will cost you to get to hell out of Medicare Advantage while you can, while you still have your health. Because those, those, and they are scumbags, all of them, even the ones that have a pretty face on, because again, the premise is you get good treatment until your particular plan starts losing money. And you are the ones that pay the price. Never will they pay the price. Welcome to Politics Done Right. I am your host, Egberto Willis. This is a progressive program that will take the mystery out of politics. This is the program that will encourage you to make sure government becomes we the people. Whether you are liberal, progressive, conservative, or otherwise, you get to hear your point of view. We are an independent media outlet that, unlike mainstream media beholden to corporations, we only owe allegiance to you. Remember, you can also send me a tweet at E-G-B-E-R-T-O-W-I-L-L-I-E-S. That is at Egberto Willis. Let us engage. It is politics done right. <laughs>